everybody to the economics uh, debate, the annual economics debate. In just a minute, I'm going to introduce Nathan Nichols, who's the uh, president of the Undergraduate Economics Club, and uh, who'll be the MC of today's event. Before I do that, though, um, every, uh, every debate, every uh, activity that we have here involves a lot of people doing a lot of work, so I first want to thank a few people. Um, first of all, thank Kevin Crocker, who's the undergraduate program director, who's been working with the, the debate teams and uh, working out the logistics for this. Uh, thank you very much, Kevin. And I want to thank uh, two people who've done an enormous amount of work to, to put all this together and make it happen. Nicole Dunham, who's the chair's assistant in economics. And Judy Fogg, who's the administrative manager here at Perry, who always walks out of the room just before uh, I thank her. <laughs> she knows that, that I tend to do this sometimes. So let's give Judy Fogg a big uh, uh, And uh, finally, I want to thank um, all of the uh, economics alumni board members who, who came up here today, three of whom I'll introduce in a moment, uh, who are going to be the judges. Um, the, uh, the Judges this year are Richard Allen, <laughs> Paul O'Keefe, and Bill Troy. <laughs> now, after the debate is over, we're going to have a, a reception. And this year, our reception is in, in order to thank our alumni board members who have been very devoted members uh, of, of uh, our alumni for a number of years now. Um, one of our members that was leaving before the reception, so I want to honor him now before, before we leave to catch a plane. Um, this alumni board has been in operation now for about, we decided, what was it, 16 years? And one of the founding members and the founding chair of the alumni board for many, many years who really poured his, uh, his heart and soul into it and is still doing so, is Stu Tobin, who came all the way from Baltimore. So, so we got Stu a little a certificate here. Yeah, that's why we're doing it. We want you to, to uh, graduate fair and proper here. Stu Tobin, class of 81, and not only that, uh, a t-shirt, which, um, which is a new t-shirt that you can wear in good health on, uh, about our debate, too big to fail. No ISLM uh, on the No, that's, that's out now. After the crisis, no more ISLM. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. For so without further ado, I want to introduce uh, Nathan Nichols, who will describe the ground rules and the, the structure of the debate. Uh, Nathan, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming to the sixth annual undergraduate economics debate. The, the title for this debate is, it gets more and more interesting and relevant as, as we were preparing. Uh, we, we, were, we were deciding what to do early, early, um, in, the, early in the semester. We were thinking what would be the, what would be the best thing uh, given the economic climate. And what we decided on is, should too big to fail banks be allowed to exist? Uh, I personally want to thank Rob for coming up with this. Rob Nass, he's a UBC officer. This was his idea, so thank you very much for that. Um, and so I would, uh, let's see. The, the debate is as follows. Each member um, has seven minutes uh, to, to uh, I guess, defend their side. And then the other team has seven, the other team, each member has seven minutes. And then we go on to the rebuttal section, where each person has up to five minutes. It probably will be more, more around three minutes per person for the rebuttals. And then there will be uh, Q&A from the judges. So uh, I guess I would, I would before, before I continue, I'd like to uh, thank Jerry for all his hard work um, in setting this up for us. Thank you very much. <laughs> You already thanked everyone else I want to thank, but I'm going to reiterate, Nicole, thank you very much, Kevin, thank you very much, alumni, thank you. 
So I guess I'll get on. I'll get on to it. Um, I want to introduce the debaters for uh, for claiming that banks should not be allowed uh, to be too big to fail. We have Anastasia Wilson, uh, Sawyer Kingley, Peter Kurtz, and Jimmy Depp on the opposing team saying that banks should be allowed to be very big. We have James Chin, Nick LeCare, Adam Betts, and Josh Sloop. So I guess I think that's all I have here. Without further ado, thank you very much and let's start the debate. Good evening everyone. So too big to fail. How can someone determine if a bank is actually too big to fail? I think what we need to do is to take a look at the bank size. So in reality, we're making a comparison between large banks and small banks. Before I go further, I'm sure you guys remember the, the fight over Microsoft back in the late 1990s to early 2000s. The federal government was trying to break up Microsoft into two companies because they felt that Microsoft had too much power and influence over the market. You might ask, how did Microsoft get to this point? Well, their primary business was selling an operating, operating system called Windows. However, according to PBS.org, Microsoft also delved into the browser market with Internet, Internet Explorer, and they started supplying this to consumers for free along with the operating system. In short, Microsoft was doing more and more and acquiring more market shares by going into different businesses. Now, if you don't see the links between two big Microsoft and two big banks, allow me to make that connection for you. The big banks became big not just because they were getting more customers and thus increasing their revenue. They became too big because they ended up having their hands on too many different markets. Many of these banks are referred to as universal banks. And it is when they get into markets that they don't specialize in that they take on highly risky behaviors, which expose them to financial troubles in the market. The bank's purpose in doing this is to take on more risk in exchange for big returns. Also, transaction fees brought them an increase in revenue, so it was only their incentives to increase transactions on a daily basis. If you look at this graph, uh, it is a graph of risk versus expected return, and risk is measured in standard deviation on the x-axis, and expected return on the y-axis. Um, and the higher the standard deviation, hence the higher the risk, the higher your expected return. But in order to get a high expected return, since you have to increase risk, it also corresponds to the fact that increasing risk makes it more less likely for your investment to be returned to you. So that's, that's the trade-off. Now, let's get this straight. Arguing that a bank is too big has little to do with how much revenue they generate or how much in assets they own. Although sometimes they may be able to go hand in hand, in general, it has little to do with it. And I would like to add that this part is my own basic analysis uh, on too big to fail based on four years of studying economics and uh, financial markets. Anyway, too big to fail has, has little to do with money. Theoretically, you can have a bank that has $100 billion in assets. However, if their assets don't jeopardize the market in such a severe manner, the bank is considered small. A too big to fail, a too big to fail bank is one that, if allowed to fail, will have an adverse effect on the economy. If some reason the bank with the hundred billion dollars in assets have most of their assets, about let's say sixty percent in non-U.S. markets and forty percent in uh, U.S. markets, they would not be too big to fail because their risk will be so diversified, and the market crash would not have hurt them as badly. Even if the market crash had hurt them badly with the last strategy. Letting them fail will not specifically hurt one country over the other. The assets that defaulted would be spread out over many different countries, and this wouldn't leave just one area, say the U.S., highly unemployed or misfortune due to the collapse of the bank. Now, you might look at me and say, and say that you disagree because that was just my own analysis. Well, before you do that, let me fill you in on what I was able to find was supposed to be. According to the Property Casualty Insurance Association of America, Systemic risk refers to the likelihood and degree of negative consequences to the larger body. And there is more, and here is my original analysis in their own work. 
With respect to federal financial regulations, the systemic risk of a financial institution is the likelihood and the degree that the institution's activities will negatively affect the larger economy, such that an unusual and extreme federal intervention will be required to ameliorate the, uh, the effects. Furthermore, according to the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, government intervention of a bank needs to pass a cost slash benefit test. Meaning that if a size of a failing institution is such that its downfall could lead to severe spillovers throughout the financial system and ultimately the real economy, then the cost slash benefit test, test has obviously been passed. Lastly, the FDICIA requires a series of steps before too big to fail rescues uh, of institutions can occur. These are three steps. One, the Secretary of Treasury must find that least cost resolutions would have serious adverse effects on economic conditions and financial stability, and that the provisions of extra legal insurance coverage would avoid or mitigate such adverse effects. Obviously, that's the most important one we are. Two, the Treasury Secretary must consult with the President in making this determination. And three, two-thirds of the governors of the Federal Reserve System and two-thirds of the directors of, of the FDIC must approve the coverage. The idea of a, hu of a huge bank regulation is an oxymoron. Big banks have political power and can influence regulations. Look at Goldman Sachs, for example. Former Ch Chairman and CEO Henry Paulson served as the United States Treasury Secretary. Do you really think that he never wants to have Goldman Sachs on his agenda as Treasury Secretary? Another reason why regulation alone might not work is because you always have institutions which are not quite like banks, also known as shadow banks. Yet, close enough to them so that they will escape the regulations just because they are not classified as, as banks. The greatest thing is with AIG. To summarize everything, big is not a number measured in dollar amount. We're not arguing that we need a bank to be so small in terms of asset size because then they won't be able to compete in a global market. We want our banks to be competitive internationally with, say, Canada. However, we do not want the banks to be big in a way that hurts our U.S. economy if things will arrive. Thank you. Uh, I would like, I'd now like to introduce my teammate, Anastasia, who will uh, elaborate further and go into specifics on some of the things I've already mentioned. is not necessarily a particular number or an amount of assets or a specific threshold, but rather a concept of whether or not the failure of one institution could potentially reverberate throughout the entire economy and ultimately affect the economic well-being of the nation. From that standpoint, it's still important to consider just how large financial institutions grew leading up to the 2008 crisis and to analyze why this happened. It is also important to look at what risks were assumed when banks began to control such a large portion of the economy and took on an enormous uh, portion of the market share of the banking industry, became highly leveraged, and interconnected to one another. To support our argument that too big to fail banks are too big to exist, I'm going to give evidence as to why unfettered large banking institutions will inevitably grow larger, take on excessive risk, and then create situations like the crisis in bailout. As we already discussed, over the past decade or so, banks have grown to hold an enormous portion of the wealth of the United States. Around 40% of total deposits um, in the U.S. during the summer of 2007 were held by the five largest banks. The graphic up here um, shows how the increase in um, bank size over GDP has occurred since 1995 up until present. Um, these five banks then were more or less in control of a large portion of the economy and the financial sector. This is important because as a nation that runs on credit, everyone's affected by this. Students, farmers, bankers, carpenters, and everyone in between. So what allowed banks to get so big? How are they able to accumulate so much wealth and profit and become so over leveraged? There are many explanations given to this, having to do with deregulation, misaligned incentives, and just plain greed. But there are also economic reasons as to why banks will, grow, will inevitably grow to be large and over leveraged. As banks accumulate more and more wealth and a larger market share of the banking industry, then they are able to borrow from investors and from each other at more or less a discounted rate from their smaller counterparts. As economist Dean Baker from the Center for Economic and Policy Research recently noted in Boston Review, 
With the history of bailouts and protection from the FDIC, large banks are implicitly too big to fail. For example, in 1984, the U.S. government bailed out the Continental Illinois National Banking Trust. At the time, this was one of the largest institutions in the country. Shortly after, during the savings and loan crisis of 1989, the government continued to hand bailouts to the financial institutions whose investments had collapsed. Investors are aware of this, and therefore they're willing to throw their money at these large firms, knowing that it's more or less secured by the government. While the American public may have short-term memories about implicit government guarantees, the banking industry certainly does not. This implied safety net allows banks to grow larger and larger, and even makes them appear safer than they really are. Um, banks seeking profit and growth will then become, inevitably become larger and more leveraged. Though it is agreed that profit and growth, um, er, Though it is agreed by many economists and legislators that capital requirements are not enough to regulate big banks, it remains astonishing that leading up into the crisis, banks held such ridiculous le leverage ratios as seen in this graphic. Um, what this shows is assets over equity, and some of the largest banks in the U.S., like Lehman Brothers and Goldman Sachs, held ratios such as 31 to 1 and 26 to 1. Um, these numbers are from 2007. However, seven years prior, the New York Federal Reserve had released um, a study that showed that high leverage ratios like this are a pretty good indicator that a bank will eventually fail. And they're just as good of an indicator as some of the complex risk-weighted ratios and calculations. The growth of banks in and of itself is not necessarily bad. Banks can potentially post record profits and reward their shareholders and keep the economy churning through investments and loans. But when banks become increasingly leveraged, a problem in the risk probability distribution arises. Research shown by the economists at the Cowles Foundation for Economic Research has shown that as banks increase their leverage, the probability distribution of risk then takes on the growth of heavy tails. This means that instead of centering risk to a steady and constant return at a mean expectation, as shown in the red line, which is a normal distribution, risk ends up being spread out with higher probabilities of gains as well as losses, like gambling. The distribution is responsible, of course, for some of the record profits that banks previously but it also contributed to the volatility of banks and the simultaneous losses and potential failures of the entire industry. Small banks, however, can't become so leveraged because they don't have these implicit guarantees, only guarantees for the consumer by the FDIC. Simultaneous is an important concept to consider when reasoning why big banks are too big to exist and will inevitably fail. As banks grow larger, they also become more interconnected to one another since with few banks around, they have no one else to trade or have transactions with. The figure on the slide shows a graphical representation of bank interconnectivity on a global scale. Um, each node represents uh, different banks from different countries, and the weighted line shows their level of interconnectedness. The analysis was done um, for Science Magazine back in 2010 just to show how interconnected our global financial institutions are. When large banks were able to develop such complex transactions between each other, like a credit default swap or a collateralized debt obligation, they end up taking on each other's risk. When something goes awry, it then can occur simultaneously and systemically. Simultaneous and systemic gains are good. We call this a boom. But simultaneous and systemic failures result in crisis, which affects much more than just bankers, as the effects are seen through unemployment, economic confidence, and eventually demand within the entire economy. This situation then only allows them for banks to be too big to fail. And in essence, it forces the government to have to bail out banks in order to avoid catastrophe. Uh, if it were possible to regulate large banks, then too big to fail problem could be avoided in the first place. However, economists like James Craig have uh, pointed out that regulating large, form, large firms is nearly impossible. As Peter will explain more detail, more detail, regulation of large institutions doesn't always work. In short, large banks inevitably, inevitably become too big, to fail, too big to fail. Their ability to grow and increase leverage simply by being large and the increased risk that is assumed by such groups growth creates conditions for failure and systemic risk for the entire economy. Limiting bank size can then limit the risk that the entire economy takes on. Now Peter will continue to discuss the political and economic arguments against large banks. Thank you, Anastasia. Banks have transformed over the past few decades into multi-functioning, multi-purpose institutions. 
these institutions have deliberately created markets in which they have the ability to trade, invest, and securitize financial, financial instruments dangerously with little or no regulation due to their exact size. The history of our banking legislation shows that how big banks were given this opportunity and how this issue has evolved into a major concern. Banks deemed too big to fail also have the intrinsic ability to alter legislation as a result of their enormous profits, making them a liability to our economy. The legislation concerning large banks' failures has created a system where banks can participate in volatile and risky ventures because of the underlying security provided by government bailouts. One institutional example that highlights this is the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which has the ability to assist failing banks through loans or direct federal acquisition of assets. The FDIC insures deposits in over 8,000 institutions nationwide and is responsible for overseeing the safety and soundness of these depository institutions. They are, more or less, the receiver of failed banks. Thomas Honig, President and CEO of the Kansas City Fed, argues that the FDIC's ability to prevent bank bailouts is insufficient. He states in an interview, the FDIC's resources and other financial industry support funds may not always be sufficient enough for this task, that is the bailout, and that treasury money may be needed. Honig is arguing here that when a big bank proves to be insolvent, the FDIC may not be able to support these crashing giants, and taxpayers will have to pay the cost of the bailout. Now, prior to 1950, excuse me, now, prior to 1950, insolvent banks were, for the most part, allowed to fail. Federal regulators dealing with the bank, with dealing with the failing bank, made banks liquidate their assets to refund depositors or sold the bank to another bank or firm. However, we now have a system that has instilled a pseudo safety net for large banks. The idea, if a big bank fails, no worries, the government will bail them out and taxpayers will get, pay the costs. The reason, banks have grown to a size where they cannot fail. They rely too heavily on each other, they control too, much, too many of our deposits, our loans, and our investments, and a failure of any of these banks would result in a catastrophe for our economy. And now it is for this reason exactly that banks too big to fail have been able to pursue highly profitable yet highly risky ventures. As you can see, the FDIC, the same corporation originally intended to oversee the safety and soundness of any risky activities of these depository institutions, now protects these big banks from failures. Multiple laws have been refurbished to allow for less regulation and failure protocols for big banks, creating a perfect environment for banks to participate in risky behavior unbeknownst to its depositors and investors. We propose a reenactment of the Glass-Steagall Act of 1933. This will prevent, this will separate commercial and investment banks, limiting, in their, limiting them in their size and decreasing their activities. A renovation of the Glass-Steagall Act will forbid banks to underwrite securities and will allow for profitable entry for potential entrants to start new banks and thus decrease the market shares of some of the biggest banks, such as Citigroup, Bank of America, JP Morgan Chase, etc. This reenactment will diminish the Financial Services and Modernization Act of 1999, preventing dangerous mergers, <coughs> limiting the bank's market operations, and their ability to undertake risky activities. Now, another mechanism large banks have used in an effort to loosen regulation is through lobbying. Even if regulation is at a point where banks are constrained from risky transactions, banks too big to fail have the ability, the funds, and the power to sway bank legislators and kink existing regulatory banking laws. This gives large banks the perfect and all the room necessary to pursue one of the most risky and highly controversial ventures, which is known as credit derivatives. Now, even if, um, excuse me, in her book, Fool's Gold, Jillian Ted explores the kind of political influence big banks has had as a result of intensive lobbying. In 1985, at a threat of, break of higher capital reserve requirements for derivatives, bankers from Solomon Brothers, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, and others created the International Swaps and Derivatives Association. This was in direct result because credit derivatives came under attack 
from regulators and the Commodity Futures Trading Company, who were astonished to learn that the size of all these elaborate derivative contracts had grown to $865 billion by 1987. Seven years later, in, 1970, in 1994, four anti-derivative bills were presented to Congress because of the potential volatility and risk attached to these derivatives. In response, the ISDA launched one of the largest lobbying campaigns in Washington. And, lo and behold, at the end of the year, all four bills were abandoned because of the extraordinarily effective lobbying campaign on behalf of the ISDA. Now, while the ISDA did an incredible job reducing regulation and overturning proposals, it must be understood that these banking behemoths that founded the ISDA had as much money and funds as would ever be needed to launch such a significant campaign, which is why excessive lobbying by banks too big to fail is hazardous to the safety of our markets. Now, we are not implying that banks need to be barred from lobbying. Instead, we are showing that when these large banks are big enough to change laws, that they will hinder the safety of our deposits and investments, and this is when big banks present big problems. Banks too big to fail have manipulated our nation's legislation and regulation on banking and created the impression that they are smart enough to cover any liabilities associated with their transactions. Too big to fail has led me to question not only the size and influence of big banks within the financial market, but whether or not big banks have become so big that they can alter the rules and laws to which they must abide to. Being that big presents an even greater threat to the citizens of this nation and the well-being of our economy. So, in conclusion, should we allow banks to become too big to fail? No, because that means too big to fail is too big to control, which is too big to exist. Thank you. Why not just regulate that? 
It's very important to note that the banks in Georgia failed not because they were overexposed to complex derivatives and other financial instruments, but rather they simply made a lot of loans that went back. If we artificially force banks to be small, they will soon, to be, they will soon offer identical goods and services. If we restrict them in this manner, they will start moving together and start making the same mistakes together. Having a large portion of small banks behaving in the same way, as in the case of Georgia, is no different than a handful of big banks doing the same thing. The herd mentality that will rise if we force banks to be small would be just as dangerous as allowing a handful of big banks to exist. The major reason we need big banks is to compete against foreign big banks. In the 1980s, it was the massive Japanese banks who were big banks, now the massive European banks. If we suddenly break up our big banks, who's to say that one of those banks won't move in and take their place? More importantly, if we abandon too big to fail and no one else does, where does that leave us? Who would want to put their money in American banks with no government guarantee? Clearly, American banks would appear much more risky. Large depositors will certainly shift their deposits to the safer foreign banks, and the result will be a sharp drop in value of the dollar as capital leaves the country. Why not create an international pact to abandon too big to fail? Well, it's politically unfeasible. So unilateral abandonment of too big to fail would not be that. Returning to Georgia, it is important to know that the majority of capital the banks that are raising is not from depositors, but rather from outside investors. This is precisely what happened in the savings and loan crisis, and it's precisely how shadow banks operate. Banks like Goldman Sachs have no depository banks. Rather, they take all their money from short-term loans in the money market. Since they do this, they don't have any reserve requirements. The problem is that since they are not subject to the same regulations, they can have much higher leverage ratios. Thus, at any given time, they have a smaller amount of liquid assets with which to pay back their investors because all of their assets are liquid long-term assets. <coughs> Thus, if they don't have any assets, they can't pay back the investors and they pay. They must raise that money in the money markets because all their investments are long-term. It would be foolish not to think that the size of institutions involved matter significantly in the crisis. However, as in the case of Georgia, when the small banks are all behaving the same way and over exposing themselves to risk, you end up with the same situation as a large bank failure. Clearly, the problem is not the size of the institutions, but in how we do or do not regulate them. After all, if the banking system is the sum of its parts, and if all its parts are exposing themselves to the same risk, then does it really matter if any one institution is larger than the others? Because if something goes wrong, then all the banks and the entire system I would now like to introduce my colleague, Abe Lutz. <clears throat> to continue, I'd like to discuss the benefits we can accrue to big banks. Banks with large amounts of assets occur in many economies of scale. And these economies of scale are the cost advantages that the business can obtain through expansion. There are certain factors of production that cause and producers average cost per unit to fall as they expand. These economies of scale exist for almost all types of businesses, including banks. We can find huge economies of scale within the infrastructure of banks. It doesn't matter if we have a branch network of 10 branches or 1,000 branches. Both networks require the same basic facilities. One would uh, need the same type of computer systems for accounting or human resource infrastructure to run a big system as a smaller system. A perfect example of this would be retail banking. In retail banking, you have to design proprietary server-based cloud computing operating systems to deliver data and applications to both your clients and your employees. In addition, they have to maintain robust security, encryption, and protection software to protect this data. And the important distinction to make here is that these larger banking systems don't inherently have more risk. They actually have less risk because their business is diversified geographically it would be less acceptable to, say, a localized recession or a regional recession. So if you split this one big company into 100 companies, you would deny them these economies of scale. But it would not remove systemic risk, which is the problem. It's a small interconnected world, and that is not going to change. Systemic risk will exist with smaller banks. Another place big banks find economies of scale is in hedging costs. All major banks are market makers or dealers within uh, bond markets, currencies, 
derivatives, commodities, and other equities. What does it mean to be a dealer? Dealers in a given security are ready to buy and sell the security at their account for publicly co <coughs> bid ask prices. Dealers need to hold inventories in these securities so that they can trade it, but they're also exposed to price movements if the price of the security is going to change. But huge investments are required to manage different types of risk, and they're constantly changing levels of exposure. This is very capital intensive, especially when you're dealing with fixed income products. The bigger the bank is, the more markets they can deal with, and they can reduce the exposure in this way. This way, big banks can find economic efficiencies in um, hedging costs. But another place where they can capture efficiency is in order flow. The larger a dealer's order flow is, the more trades they can match internally. Say a broker gives them some trades, some orders to buy this security and to sell this security, and they can match them all together. And they can reduce their exposure to sharp price movements because they don't have to get the trade by themselves. A lot of the financials industry's merger mania over the last 15 years is the race to capture this order flow. Finally, having huge market makers ensures liquidity in capital markets. As stated, dealers are willing to buy and sell securities right away at publicly quoted bid ask prices. So this will reduce borrowing costs for investors. This is important because investors are more likely to buy a bond if they know that they'll be able to quickly and easily sell their position later. As expected, Investors will require higher yields for the liquid bonds. The benefits of having these market makers was going to be passed down to businesses that are able to borrow in the capital markets at a lower cost, and the investors who enjoy reduced transaction and higher returns. Lastly, lastly, big banks are more competitive in the global marketplace. The core of financial activity depends on reputation, information networks, and the ability to make markets and trade on them. The size of a bank becomes critical as it's competing against an increasingly globalized marketplace. If we limit the size of our banks, they'll struggle to compete when facing off with a larger competitor abroad, such as the European banks. Smaller banks will struggle without these benefits and will have declining profits. Many businesses in the nation need sophisticated and complicated products in order to be successful. To offer these services, banks need to have large amounts of capital. For example, many large international corporations have the need to raise money in countries like China and other foreign markets. To service this growing need, a bank needs to raise money in these markets so that they'll be able to conduct business abroad. It would be better for American banks if this business went to them as opposed to foreign banks. But to do so, we need to have big, successful, profitable, sophisticated banks with a lot of capital. By limiting the size of our banks, we're limiting the size of their profits because we're limiting where they can compete in and what products they can offer. But if you'd be so kind, I would like to introduce my colleague, Rick Lecker, who will talk about systemic risk and how we can manage it. Thank you, thanks, Prevention, prevention, prevention. <clears throat> Public outcry is at an all-time high. Concerning, concerning the financial industry, that something has to be done. No system that controls such large amounts of capital in the world should be at the risk of failing. It is a known fact that investors in bank alike will always overextend themselves during good economic times in America. And it is inevitable that when bankers see investment, investment profits, the higher risk can be easily overlooked. <coughs> but to fully understand the required regulation the future of big banking, we must be, full, be able to understand specific failures of the massive firms like Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, AIG, Washington Mutual, that created so much public outcry. The first of the collapse banks, Bear Stearns, not surprisingly held a reputation as the biggest risk taker. Yet, despite the risky behavior, was actually an extremely successful bank since their founding all the way back in 1923 which includes over 80 years of successful banking. Yet, this recent recession completely took the cake in bankrupting Bear Stearns, starring the largest financial collapse known in American history. It's important to note that Bear Stearns and the massive fixed asset department were focused on mortgage-based securities. Now, mortgage-based securities are a type of revenue that combine giant international market for mortgages 
to a similar investment tool for large banks, creating greater incentives for the smaller mortgage company to grant as many mortgages as they could, resulting in a large amount of mortgages that maybe shouldn't have been granted to you know, everyone who generally wants a house. In addition, since September 11th, the increase in money supply made these mortgages that much more attractive to grant. Now, in the years prior to this financial collapse, mortgage-backed securities were the best way to make a large profit. And nowadays, they are known to experts as toxic assets, since they have practically destroyed the American economy. Not surprisingly, Bear Stearns had a massive percentage of their investments rooting from these mortgages, leading to their ultimate demise in 2008. But now, the question remains, how does our government in the future more effectively recognize these speculative bubbles and have the authority to prevent them from becoming too big? Well, a few effective and intensive solutions include an insurance fund, completely supplied by these risk-taking banks that would not only it would be only used when the banks bank, face bankruptcy like that during 2008. This would put increasing pressure on banks to prevent failing without having the government and the average non-investing taxpayer to be their safety net. This would allow banks to be technically too big to fail, but the mechanism allowing them to fail would be their own money at work. Now, point uh, solution number two, we can start with J.P. Morgan Chase, one of the largest financial institutions that happened to survive this financial disaster, had their only loss in 2009 and the $2 of $2.2 billion in their credit card markets. Another more controversial regulatory measure would be an independent consumer protection agency. This new government department would be designed to protect and educate consumers from being taken advantage of by credit card loans, mortgages, and other predatory financing. This would be necessary simply as a counterforce against the financial institutions that prey on unsuspecting Americans that desperately need financing. This could be necessary. No. Although many people think financial literacy should come from consumers' own initiative, preventing the average American from paying bankruptcy would be another force to help prevent future financial collapse of large banks. The third point of the solution starts with. Now, the Security Exchange Commission, the SEC, and the Office of the Comptroller of Currency both have the jurisdiction to regulate risk in the financial sector, but experts after this recent disaster feel it needs to be a new organization labeled as a systematic risk regulator that could reside a part of the Federal Reserve or be independent. Now, this systematic risk regulator would directly address asset bubbles as well as create new, stronger capital requirements for large financial institutions, especially those marked as Tier 1, or the banks that TARP bailed out. Also, these higher insurance premiums will also be set by this new organization as well. Those are three effective solutions, to say the least. Now, in conclusion, me and my colleagues have had a multifaceted argument covering all angles. Our key points just explained in detail include, one, do the same computer systems, bank bureaucracies, and many other aspects by a bank. Large banks benefit from a massive advantage due to scale. Large banks allow large investments for equally large international corporations. Successful economies in this day and age must be able to have a large amount of capital to move quickly around the world. Small banks cause financial problems. Point number two would be small banks cause financial problems as well. That could amount to global prices just the same as large banks do. Point number three, giant foreign banks, you have to be aware of, for example, in Japan, Germany, Sweden, Canada, Great Britain, would have a massive advantage over our forced to be small banks. Point number four, part of the past crisis is due to economic cycles that have been occurring through the entire 20th century and has been recognized by the most basic economic teachings to be inevitable. And uh, the final point, which I guess explained, the current administration and Senate are working diligently on a new regulation that will be sure to prevent anything like this problem from happening again. Therefore, large banks are entirely unnecessary in America. It would be a huge mistake to disallow them from the distance. Too big to fail is simply a term given to spark public outcry for advocates for the most socialist society preventing America to use the financial system to their full advantage. Thank you. First of all, let's get this straight. The argument is too big to fail. Should a bank be too big to fail? We're not 
Okay, and in, order to, in order to determine if a bank should be too big to fail, the asset size, the bank size has nothing to do with it. And my, uh, my uh, opponent over here, Josh, states banks should be allowed to grow, which we agree, they should be allowed to grow. And small and mid-sized institutions are no good. Yes, they're no good because then they can't compete in a global market. We stated that, we agree with that. But in order for a bank to be too big to fail, systemic risk has everything to do with it. And systemic risk should not be confused with unsystematic or systematic risk. And I think my uh, opponent, Abe over here, got that confused because he stated systemic risk instead of systematic risk. He claimed that um, even small banks have sy system, um, systemic risk, which is false. Small banks don't have systemic risk because systemic risk refers to uh, a bank that adversely affects the economy. Um, and we know that if it's a small bank, then how can it adversely affect the economy? It can't. Um, also, Josh states that small banks uh, small bank failing is no different from a large bank failing. Well, this is obviously not true, once again. A big bank, one that could adversely affect the economy, has this disastrous effects when failing. A small bank that won't really affect the economy may fail, and our economy will still be intact. A bank should be small in terms of two banks to fail. And that, that's basically it. Thank you, Troy. Um, I'd just like to first start on one of the things arguments. Uh, you mentioned that big banks are necessary because they can carry such diverse portfolios. Now, highly diversified banks were created um, mostly in the 80s because it was, because it was in an effort to, to protect their assets. That is, if one department were to go into a, bu a bust, then the other department can or other departments that the banks have will still be doing good and still be able to generate profits for the banks. This created a kind of one-stop shopping in the banking industry. Now, with that aside, I just want to say that the idea that we need big banks to compete with other foreign banks is a fallacy. Now, while global competition within the banking industry is necessary for a healthy international market, we as a nation do not need mega banks to compete with other foreign banks. Um, prior to our crisis, many of our banks, which have now been classified as too big to fail, were participating and competing willfully with foreign banks. However, international banking, um, excuse me, capital market operations within and outside the country constitute a significant source of risk because they are less regulated and in some cases not regulated at all. Now, I'd like to quote um, Thomas Honey again, uh, if you recall, the president and CEO of the Kansas City Fed. Um, in an interview, he was asked, he was asked um, whether the US needs mega banks to stay competitive in the world of international finance and economy. This is what he said, and I quote, this is a fantasy. I don't know how else to describe it. Our strengths will be from having a strong industrial economy. We will have financial institutions that are large enough to give us influence in the markets, but not so large that they're too big to fail. The outcome of this is that strong banks and strong economies bring capital to themselves, and they are by themselves competitive. The United States became a financial center not because we had the largest institutions, but because we had a strong industrial economy with a good working financial system across the nation, not just highly concentrated in one area. Um, so that is all I have for my book. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. So my esteemed colleagues to my left, I've tried to tell you that America needs large banks because of all the services and benefits they are able to provide. Big is better because of what big can offer its customers and the economy. I feel it necessary to repeat this point. First of all, one service that big banks really should provide for the overall economy is an availability of credit to small businesses. However, even America's biggest banks can't quite seem to provide a sufficient level of such lending. Earlier this month, Charlie Cray, the director 
of the Center for Corporate Policy said that according to the U.S. Treasury's monthly TARP lending survey released in March, lending to small businesses by the nine big U.S. banks that received federal bailout money fell almost $20 billion between December and January. The $19.3 billion in loan originations for the month of January was the smallest amount since October, which was the last month that new loans had fallen. So, even as those big banks deemed too big to fail have received billions of TARP dollars, they have not done their part to provide the conditions and small business loans necessary for a thorough, large-scale economic recovery. There are also heavily researched examples in which small banks had clear comparative advantages at certain operations. Back in 2003, five major economists, including a senior economist at the Board of Governors of the Fed, wrote a paper for the Journal of Financial Economics by the name of Does Function Allow Follow Organizational Form? Evidence from the Lending Practices of Large and Small Banks. In the paper, Bergen et al. analyzed the incentives that work inside both large and small banking institutions. First of all, the different incentives found in different banks lead to different sorts of information specialization. The aforementioned study concludes that small firms are at a comparative advantage in evaluating investment projects when the information about these projects is naturally soft or can't be easily communicated from one agent to another. Also, large banks will shy away from small business lending and will not give character loans. The model predicts that a loan officer in a large bank has little incentive to produce high quality information in such a case. Operatives at small banks face control incentives to gather soft information and to direct their bank to make loans the small businesses believe to be credible via the soft information. These operatives behave this way because at a small bank, they can more likely get done what they want to get done. Here's an example that ought to illustrate the incentive situation. Imagine, if you will, two loan officers. One loan officer works at a small bank, the other works at a large bank. The loan officer employed by the small bank is only one of a few such operatives at his or her bank. This loan officer has a rather strong voice at the bank in terms of capital allocation. As such, this loan officer can count on his or her opinions regarding potential borrowers to be thoroughly considered. The loan officer at the small bank can then make suggestions for loans based on whatever sorts of information they may find adequate, as long as it pays off and the borrower pays up. The loan officer at the big bank is one of many operatives and exists within a hierarchical framework. This loan officer may spend a lot of time and energy harvesting information about potential loan candidates in the area. However, relative to the size of the large bank institution, the loan official likely goes in this way. He or she is not all that sure how likely their opinions and data will be utilized. As such, given their lack of control, Loan officials at large banks have little or no incentive to acquire any extra information beyond that which can be easily forwarded up the chain of command. Furthermore, in conducting my research, I have found few worthwhile justifications for the current sizes of America's mega banks. In a recent Huffington Post article, Robert Reich even went as far as to say that the only way to ensure that no bank is too big to fail is to make sure no bank is too big, period. Nobody has been able to show any scale efficiencies over $100 billion in assets, so that should be the limit. Currently, America's mega banks are far larger than this. In conclusion, I'm not trying to set a specific asset or size limit. I'm just trying to make it clear that America's mega banks are not beneficial to the economic well-being of this country, and they ought to be downsized. Thank you very much. Uh, will the second team uh, please give their rebuttals to the presentation given by Paul? Well, I'd like to clear something up. It seems that my opponents believe that I was implying that when a small bank fails, it's the same as a larger bank, a singular small bank. That's not quite what I was getting at. I was implying more that a lot of small banks fail at the same time. That's the same as a large bank fail. And that's pretty much what happened in Georgia. All the small banks are doing all the same things, making all the bad loans because there aren't the laws there to protect the consumers and the depositors. You make a lot of loans to people who shouldn't, or they can't pay you back, well, America goes bust. And if all the small banks are doing that, then all the small banks go bust. And that's would be the same as a large bank going bust. Really good. 
So I just like to preface what I'm going to say by saying um, it wasn't just banks. It, it was also the government and individuals that are involved in this crisis and why we came to where we are. And of course, banks are taking the brunt of it, and I think it's, it's well deserved. And until like the unemployment rate goes back up, they're going to suffer. And they're going to take the brunt of everyone's anger. But I, I have to say, the fact is banks create a lot of value. If I were to pose this question now, big banks create a lot of value. What bank do people bank with here, especially in UMass? I think everyone would say Bank of America, which happens to be the biggest bank right now in the US. Why? Because it creates so much value. Think about how easy it is to go to a branch of Bank of America to get something notarized, to get cash from an ATM, to pay your bills online, to track your expenses. Small banks don't have ATMs. I have uh, a credit union, and they have some 41 ATMs, not nearly as accessible funds as big banks. And our opponents say that competition with large foreign banks is of no consequence, and I think they're saying that we could bank within the US and ignore the rest of the world, which is, I think, almost like too prideful to say that we can't interact financially with other countries. And I think that's something that we would need to do. And that's why we need the bigger banks that be able to complete, compete in markets that foreign banks in Europe are taking over. Also, they're saying that big banks have way too much political power and that they can lobby and get things their way. But I would like to say that this could happen the same through organizations like the ABA, which organize banks together. And you have the same threat of lobbying, so splitting up bigger banks into smaller banks will not solve that problem. Uh, to finish it off, I would like to talk about <coughs> Suarez's argument about Microsoft and ARG. First of all, they both are not banks. Even though they have monopolistic like contentions, this is Microsoft trying to blow up to uh, like Internet Explorer and whatnot. Those are still functions of computers. So whereas uh, the law case in the nineties and two thousands, they try to break up and prevent Microsoft from having a monopoly, not owning market shares. So for one thing, banks, for example, the RBC, the World Bank of Canada, in Canada actually has about thirty eight percent of the market share in Canada, and it's still making about two billion dollars in terms of investments every year. So to say that banks too big to fail, that's practically not true because we can see through different lenses of other countries that they are too big to fail. We can see in Sweden, Germany, Switzerland, Canada, et cetera, that big banks can prevail when regulated correctly. For example, in the Commonwealth, Commonwealth Law of Canada, there's actually a, two institutions that monitor the two big banks within Canada under different regulations of every other bank. And I'm trying to say that the U.S. needs to implement new regulations to enforce these different things, aside from small banks. For example, when a big bank fails, it breaks down like smaller banks, like the market itself. But you can collectively like control how it fails, where it fails, and how it, like to prevent itself from failing. But the size of the bank does not matter. Another thing is that, sorry, implemented is that the transaction fees here record revenue within banks. That's like saying you go to a restaurant and say, hey, I'm not paying for this food because I know how much it costs. You're going to buy for this as a service. So what banks do in terms of like offerings, like services, and like transaction fees, that's part of banking. <coughs> much like investing is also a part of banking. For you to say that risk, like obviously higher risk equates to higher like, return profits. That's why we have like, the account argument of the systematic risk regulator that implements like a regulation on how risk should be regulated. So higher risk because higher capital returns and higher insurance, which is another one of our arguments saying that if we have an insurance premium within all these banks, then they're safe, even if they were to fail. Another argument is that for people in society to social interact with the banks and to connect that with lobbyists is not fair. Just because you know people in high places or like it's connected with networks and circuits, that doesn't mean you're in the future power of like, oh, I'm a CEO of this big bank. Let me do this and that. Like, that's not how it goes. One person or like one person <coughs> line is not going to affect the whole system. Like what we're looking at is like the system of capitalism itself is a cycle. You make money and you lose money. That's just how it goes. You can't say, oh, big banks fail. That's what's wrong with it. Big banks will continue to fail. Small banks will continue to fail. What we're saying is that banking regulations shift the policies to reduce risk. Instead of something we are like 
like all four. There's the institutions like shadow banks and other institutions like AIG and the small majority banks that when they do mess up, it affects the system as a whole. What I'm saying is that regular banks do not break the safety net, which is part of their banks, because they generate money into the economy. So there are no big banks, there is no economy. And what's no economy? Everybody sucks. That's all I'm saying. You guys want to go first? Large banks generate value. Uh, Point okay. two, as long as taking on more risk is more profitable, even if you have all small banks, they'll still be doing that and they'll still have the same problems they do now. So it doesn't even really matter. And third, if you get rid of it, then there will be massive capital flight from the US to the foreign banks. Okay. Yeah. All right, you So, uh, let's see, three major points. Um, uh, point number one is um, large banks seem to have had, 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 had it of becoming far uh, more interconnected than our economy can handle. Um, we've, we've heard about like capitalist systems, rise and fall, uh, profit and then not. When you get to the point of largeness and interconnectivity of large banks, you have a problem where like you have these big, big, big dominoes, and you only have a few of them. And when each domino falls, it has a huge weight uh, in, in its destruction of fat. If you have like you know, <laughs> um, point two would be a uh, political, like the political uh, realities. You have these huge, huge banks that have huge lobbying potential on both the legislation that is made and over the day-to-day -day regulatory action and protocol that actually gets enforced. There's laws in books and then there's laws that are enforced. Um, and three, uh, third point, um, lastly, we just, just the fact that we have our you know, our society, and not really our society, but the people in charge of regulating these banks have created, created and not that it's their fault, but they have to bail out these banks. These banks are too big. And if they do fail, if they were to fail, if we weren't to nationalize them, then we would have been in some sort of terrible, terrible state because we didn't bail them out. Not to say that nationalizing may be the wrong choice, but however, had those banks not been that big in the first place, then we wouldn't have had to do that. We wouldn't have had to take these kind of actions. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good. Is that the you can deliver it? No. They usually announce that at the because they have to deliver it. Yeah. So I guess. Right now we're going to do something new. Uh, this year, for the first time ever, we have certificates for all the uh, members of the debate teams. So um, what's going to happen next is that um, the judges are going to be secluded into a room and tell them um, yeah, all they have is bread and water until they decide a winner. At which time they'll come downstairs where we will already be fed. And, uh, the scraps. <laughs> and uh, they will they will tell us who won. So um, I'm gonna hand, hand these out and yeah, and then we can all head downstairs. So the first one is to Anastasia. Yay.
is our, our case. We did a terrific job. Then having, having said that, we had to pick a side, and, then, and then, so the test was, well, which do we think that the arguments we made in, in the most compelling and convincing way? And, uh, and I have to go with the, and I don't forget the term, but the, uh, the too big to fail to as, uh, as one. And uh, they're doing a terrific job. And, uh,